everybody for coming. This is my hometown. So um, I want to obviously thank Howard for coming. And as I, we've done two of these events so far, and I always have to thank Howard for writing, no, not writing the book, writing for president so I could write a book. So I always have to thank him for that. Um, um, I just want to um, say a few things about Brattleboro before I start getting into the, the details of the book and Howard will speak for a little bit and then we'll take questions. Um, in some ways, like not in some ways, a lot of ways it's very special to do this event here. Um, I have to say a special thank you to my family who not only dealt with the presidential campaign but every time Howard had sort of a bright idea when he was governor, the first person people we call sometimes would be my parents or my brother or my sister. And so they got dragged into pretty much everything that we did. And they were actually involved in the campaign before it was even a campaign. Um, if you read the book or you've read the book, you know that we had, um, a, we formed a political action committee before we actually formed the presidential committee. Um, it was a PAC. We thought it was super, but it's not like the super PACs that you have now. Um, and we formed it, and it was easy to form. You can form a PAC, you can um, form a um, presidential committee pretty easily. You just fill in the papers and send it down to the Federal Election Commission. So we formed this PAC, <coughs> Fund for a Healthy America, send the paperwork down. Then we realized, oh no, you know, we need money to, to actually do anything. So. What do you do when you need money for something that is really sort of unexplainable what you're doing? So who do you call? I dialed up my parents and I go, oh, we need some money. And they're like, they almost didn't even ask what for because they figured they were gonna have to give it to something for some reason. So they actually um, gave us the money to buy the stamps to send out our first fundraising letter for Fund for Healthy America. Then when we needed a website, we're like, who do we know that will do a website for free? So I called my brother-in-law who lives in Vernon and I said, we need a website for this thing that you don't really understand what it is or what we're doing. So we had a website. So I need to just give a special thank you to them because every time Howard wanted to do something, they got sucked in. And they got sucked in during the presidential campaign too. Um, one of the reasons, and. Um, I wrote the book actually too was uh, for my family. I never intended to write a book that anybody else would see. So it's a sort of amazing to me that this has happened. And what the book is, for those of you who haven't um, read it yet, it's a diary or a day-to-day -day journal of what we did on the campaign, on the campaign from the very beginning in 2000 when Howard came up with the idea that he wanted to run for president all the way till February of 2004 when the, when the um, campaign ended. And one of the things I realized after the campaign when I came back to Brattleboro was that, you know, I assumed everybody knew what we were doing all the time. But the truth is, what people knew what we were doing is what they saw on TV or maybe read in an article, which, you know, gives you maybe a one minute a day look at what goes on inside a campaign. And it was, you know, my family in particular, it was very difficult because of, you know, we were on the road I traveled with Howard, and we were on the road six days a week. Um, you know, we were working 18 whatever hours a day. Um, so it was really hard to communicate with my family, saying, hey, here's we are, where we are. They, they would track where I was um, by reading the newspaper and said, oh, Howard's in Iowa today, so Kate's in Iowa. Um, or they'd see me on C-SPAN, and every once in a while I'd get a phone call, we're watching you on C-SPAN. So they would know what we were doing in these little increments. So when I came back, it was my brother actually who was like, you have to write this down. And I didn't, you know, I just was like, oh, I don't, I don't want to remember any of it, you know, I don't want to write it down. But he was persistent. 
So I actually wrote a first draft of the book, and it was the most negative thing ever. Because, you know, I, I hadn't slept, I hadn't eaten, and Howard had to, you know, had dropped out, and the press was nasty to us, and the other candidates were nasty, so the first draft was just awful. So I set it aside, and about a year later, I'm like, okay, I'm in a better place. <laughs> I can see this better. So I sat down and I wrote it, and I just started from day one, I just kept going each day. And I didn't uh, want to write an analysis, because again, I was doing this for people, like my family, to say, here's what your kid did for these three years or whatever of your life. So it wasn't an analysis, it's a, a literally a journal, a day-to-day -day journal. And, but what was interesting is I, sh I showed it a couple of years ago, I showed it to somebody outside my family. It was like, you know, this is really interesting. So that's sort of how it became a book for the general public to see. And what I, what I didn't intentionally do, but what ended up happening is it is an analysis of the campaign without being one. You know, it's a day-to-day -day, um, <coughs> journal, and what you do is when you um, read it, you come to your you know, conclusions of, oh, now I sort of get what happened. Um, I have very strong beliefs about what happened, and I didn't really want to say everything that I thought, but it's interesting. <laughs> it's been interesting because the reaction I've gotten is, is people get it now without me having to, to say it. Um, it was a very interesting experience, and again, I saw a lot of you folks when I came back, and you know, people were just, people were really excited, and I think they were excited, one, because, you know, here's a Brattleboro person that has worked on this pres su uh, successful presidential campaign, but they were also excited for Howard, because he was the governor of Vermont, and there was his connection. Um, so, when I came back in, um, one of the things that Brattleboro did for me, too, was bring me back down to, like, reality. When, what you're doing on a presidential campaign that you think is perfectly normal, you find out that for the rest of the world, it's, like, crazy. You know, that we would go days upon days without really getting any sleep, that Howard's idea of saving money was to take a red eye so we wouldn't have to pay for a hotel room, um, that you eat, you eat candy, you know, that, that Skittles is not on the food pyramid. So, you know, I came back here and I realized, gosh, everything I thought was normal is not normal. So that's another thing I think comes out in the book is that I wrote what we did and I've gotten this really great reaction from people that are going, you know, what you guys did wasn't normal. And I was like, I know, it took like five years for me to figure out that it wasn't normal. So I hope everybody, you know, really enjoys it. I wanted people to get a really good sense of what it is like inside a presidential campaign. One of the things that I find interesting now watching the current presidential campaign is you do, you see like a minute of what's going on on television, but I always think I know what's probably going on behind the scenes. Um, you know, I don't know if you saw recently that Rick Santorum literally just like had this meltdown or blew up and I'm like, I get why he did it. He probably hasn't eaten, he probably hasn't slept, he's probably under huge amounts of stress because we had some of that. <laughs> Howard, all off. You know what? All right, let's go. Let's go. Howard told me there was a guy, we were at a senior center in Iowa, and um, the guy got up and told Howard that, you know, George Bush is our neighbor, you need to be nicer to, I don't know if you remember this, you need to be nicer to George Bush. And Howard said, you know, George Bush is not my neighbor. And the guy started to say something, and Howard's like, sit down, you are your chance, I am mine. So when Rick, when Rick Santorum did this, I'm like, oh gosh, you know, I get why, I get why it happens. So that's sort of the sense I really wanted people to understand from the book, is what it really is like inside a presidential campaign. Um, and I think by reading it, you can really sort of come to your own conclusions or understanding about maybe this is why we ended up like we did. But in all in all, we, it, was, it, was, it was enjoyable for me to do it. Some of you saw me afterwards and probably thought, I would never say that, so I would never say that. But it was enjoyable, it was, it was a real learning experience. And um, it was something that uh, I wouldn't trade for a minute, because it was very interesting. And what I want to do now is just have Howard say a few words, and then we'll take questions. And I'm um, happy to answer any questions about the book, and I know Howard's happy to answer any questions about the current state of affairs. But um, hopefully, in, we've got everyone's book store, um, everyone's bookstore here, and um, they've been really 
very supportive. So if anyone wants to get a copy of the book, you can get one. Um, but here's Howard. <laughs> Thank for writing the book, although not for her introduction of me right now. And, and I don't want to thank her for putting up those pictures either. I ate my way through Iowa and New Hampshire, and there was a picture of over there when I was weighed 35 pounds more than I do today. Uh, it was pretty heavy. I used to get on the plane and just there was this huge bowl of M&M. This is when we actually had a charter, and we just I just sit down and I just get gorged on peanut M&Ms, and that's what I ate for three months plus milkshakes. What else? Fr uh, fried Coca-Cola, oh. fried Oreos, and fried ice cream in the <laughs> Iowa. There, they are, there are stranger states than Vermont that are agricultural, and Iowa is one of them. Of course, I ever, better not ever run again, because somebody will take that clip and put it on the television like Gephardt did before. It's great to be in Brat. Uh, this is kind of my second hometown uh, in Vermont, partly because of the O'Connors, uh, and because Liz and Julie are here, who are mentor and chief of staff respectively, and, and for Kate, because she worked for me for a long, long time, all the time I was in the governor's office, plus running my lieutenant governor's campaign, so thank you again. Uh, I, I must say, I did have the same reaction Kate did to Santorum. First of all, I know the reporter, he lied to me once, so I, I was totally on Santorum's side, because I knew what the, exactly what the reporter was doing. Um, he's not a nice guy, and the paper he works for is very self-inflated. Uh, so, um, <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk, I'll just talk a little bit about the book, uh, and, and uh, the, this is, uh, and I'm, I don't make any money off this book, Kate does, but I had nothing to do with writing it, other than just the entertainment. So this is the best political book about a campaign I've ever read, yeah. and I'll tell you why. I've gotten so sick of all the gossipy political books in Washington, because it's all about smut and silly stuff that went on and nastiness. I, I refuse to buy Game Change, either the book or see the movie, because it's so nasty and mean. This is not a nasty, mean book. This is a book about what really happens on a campaign. Un, ungilded by the, by the incredibly cynical views of the people who write about politics in this country. And I, I love this book. Uh, I, I first saw the first draft of it, well evidently it wasn't the first draft, I saw a cheerful one last <laughs> summer in July. Um, but it, it's really, if, if you haven't read it, you, you ought to pick up a copy. It's really, it's long, but it's every bit of it is fun, gentle, you don't have to read the whole thing in one night. It really gives the best sense of, of what a campaign is really like uh, better than anything I've ever read, including some of the great ones like The Boys on the Bus and stuff. But all that stuff is, is vignettes. This one is the real deal. So it really is a, it's a, it's a, a, a Kate did a fantastic job um, writing it. Secondly, uh, I, I feel the same way about the campaign. We didn't win, uh, but it was a great experience. I wouldn't give it up. Uh, it, I learned an enormous amount. Um, and, you know, I think some of the influence that we had was enormous. Um, uh, we did one of these in, in Shelburne last week, and somebody asked us you know, how we felt about the campaign, and the truth is I think we actually won. Because uh, if you ask anybody about the 2004 campaign, the Democratic side, they're not going to tell you about Kerry's campaign, they're going to tell you about ours. And we didn't win because of me. Um, we won because what we were smart enough to do as a team is to look at what 23-year-olds were doing, how they were getting things together, watching what the American people were doing. We were walking down the street one time in, in Burlington. This is, uh, uh, by the way, speaking of fundraising, we don't, as you know, I'm uh, somewhat of a perpetual motion machine. So when I left the governor's office at noon and Jim Douglas took the oath of office, that evening we were in Brattleboro at Tim and Martha's place doing, or maybe it was Buddy's place, doing a, doing a fundraiser. Uh, for the presidential pack. I mean, there was no daylight between leaving the governor's office and, and keeping going. Uh, but what we learned, I was walking down the street with Kate, and our first office was in Montpelier. It was in a chiropractor's, uh, above a chiropractor's office. We had one employee, that was Kate, because she had to leave the governor's office, obviously, to do this. And one, and um, so we were walking down the street in Montpelier, and she said, well, you're number six on Meetup. And I said, what is Meetup? <laughs> she explained it was this website that uh, wasn't designed for politics, but people were using this because of the message of the campaign. But, by the way, it's important to understand the message of the campaign had nothing to do with Iraq. It attracted a lot of attention. The message of the campaign was that you matter, that individuals have the power to change their lives, and nobody was saying that. Everybody was feeling very downtrodden with the horrible things that were going on in the country, and the Democrats, frankly, were going right along with Bush 
and you know approving three quarters of his stuff. And what we did is basically stand up and say, no, we don't have to do this, and you don't have to be like this. You can stand up for yourself, and guess what? You can change things. So. Meetup was this site that had nothing to do with politics. It was to get people together who were, had a common interest and meet once a month. And it was, it was adapted by people who believed that we could make a difference on their own. We had nothing to do with it. Then a week later, I was walking down the street in Burlington with Kate. And she said, well, you're number two on Meetup. And I said, you got to be kidding me. Who's number one? She said, witches. <laughs> And you know something about witches? I read uh, Clay Shirky's book uh, last, last night, about it, which is an incredible book called Here Comes Everybody, and if you haven't read it, you should. It's about the net. And witches are still number one on Meetup about 10 years later. <laughs> so um, what, eventually, what happened was the same site was taken over, and we watched the people of the country, that was fueled by young people, but there were a lot of people our age who dropped out of politics and now were coming back in for the first time, who were determined to make a difference. And the campaign just grew and grew and grew. So um, it, it really is a campaign that affected everything that's come since. Uh, and I, there are a lot of other people who aren't here that I want to thank for that. But the people who really deserve the most thanks, other than the people who worked themselves in the bone like Kate, were the people of this country who really believed that they could change America. And four years later, they did really change America. And we've got to keep fighting because once you get down into that meat writer, writer in Washington, your tendency is to make compromises. You don't have to do that. And the rest of us can make an enormous difference in forcing people not to compromise our core beliefs. I don't mind compromising over money or whatever. But I do mind co compromising over human rights and the things that make America great. We don't have to do that anymore. We can fight back and we have the means to do that. And that's what the campaign was all about. So Kate has written what I think is a great book without edginess that really talks about an American story. Uh, and I think that American story is still going on. Thanks very much. This guy was born in the same year as my daughter and Julie's son. So it's kind of nice to have you here. <laughs> Okay, so I'll give them the mics. Uh, I, I'm just going to point to people and try to be somewhat fair. So just raise your hand, and uh, when I thank you, say what you want to say. Anybody have a question? If, if you have, if there are any <laughs> questions. Yeah. Hi, this is for Kate. Uh, I was very curious about your first draft and your second draft. Would we have liked the first draft? And if so, our, would, if we, would we have gotten a lot out of the first draft? I, as I was wondering about the emotional piece of it that you might have find, you know, smoothed it out a bit in your second draft, and you know, there's all the stuff you mentioned that were kind of difficult. What, what would we have thought about the first draft? I haven't read the second draft. What's interesting, I think, about the first draft, and you know, I've thought about this, I've thought about this actually more lately than I did at the time. Uh, what a lot of people do, and I know that Howard's campaign manager Joe Trippy did this. They rush a book, you know, to get out before the election cycle. You know, Joe left the campaign in January, and he had a book on the shelves in May. And of course, I had I really, you know, again, I hadn't thought about writing a book. But when I did the first draft and I looked at it, I, you know, you're, you, and again, it was sort of like, I don't, I haven't talked to Joe to say would you have written a different book now than you would back then. And I look at the, the book that I wrote back then, and it really, I, it really just reflected the negative emotions that I had. <coughs> and it was one of the pieces to it was Joe and I just fought constantly. And that first draft really, like, it was every fight we ever had <laughs> is in this, in this first draft. And when I went back to look at it again, I thought, you know, put this in perspective. The campaign wasn't about the fights that you and Joe had. You know, it was about Howard running for president and the, his supporters. So it might be really entertaining. <laughs> Howard probably would find it quite entertaining. So there's a lot of stuff in there that he doesn't, he's clueless about. But, <laughs> but I, you know, I've, and I've thought a lot about it because a lot of people do that. Or there, or there are um, articles we had a lot of newspaper or magazine articles written about Howard's campaign, you know, right after he dropped out, and those would frustrate the heck out of me, because I'm like, they're not representative of really what happened. 
So that's sort of what that first draft is. It was like I was focusing on things that I look now going, that wasn't the focus. It wasn't even my focus 24 hours a day, but it became it after, after it ended. Thank you. I'm just curious. Uh, one thing that struck me when reading the book is uh, just the amount of flaming insubordination from, uh, from, uh, from people that you trusted. And I'm just curious if either of you have any, any ideas about, about who runs political campaigns and who, who could keep them under control and issues of legal. <laughs> I think in, Howard can, I don't know if he'll give the same answer. I saw a lot of stuff I know that Howard never saw. And that's, you know, what, what Jeff is talking about in the book is that we had um, consultants. Um, again, I, with the campaign manager, Joe Trippi, and I did not get along. What I found personally with all the sort of stuff that was happening, the more successful Howard got, the more dysfunctional we got as a staff. And I talk a little bit about this in the book, is that I watched some of the people that came in, you know, that helped us from the very, very beginning. There were, you know, some of them had worked for Howard as, as consultants, media consultants when he was governor. But sort of what happened is it became this allure of working for the front runner. You know, like, oh, we work for the front runner. And it was like, I want to be the next James Carvel. And that sort of out, in my, this is totally my opinion, you know, that what I saw was that people sort of were looking to, ahead to their future as opposed to remembering what we were actually doing. And I, I personally think that that's what contributed to a lot of what happened to us because it became like we were forgetting that there's a presidential campaign going that Howard hadn't even won. And a lot of our dysfunction came right before Iowa there was this assumption um, among some on the staff and some of the consultants that we had it, we had it made, you know, Howard's gonna win Iowa, he's gonna win New Hampshire, he's gonna be the nominee, and they were looking towards what that meant for them as opposed to what that meant for the campaign. And, you know, I, I, I saw a lot that Howard didn't see, and I talk a little bit about it in the book, and my first draft talks a lot about it. <laughs> but I think that's sort of what, I think that was really what the problem was, people just <coughs> lost sight of what the whole thing was about, especially when we got, you know, Howard took off, and you, everything's really changed for us then. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the reason, that there's three reasons we lost the can we lost. Uh, the, one of them is not the screen speech, by the way, because that happened after I'd already come in third, and if you come in third in Iowa, you're supposed to come first to ask Hillary Clinton what happens. So. The, the first was, I was a flawed candidate. That is, I started from a small state with 600,000 people and with no money, uh, and some national experience as the head of the various national governors organizations and so forth. Uh, but when you get into a big, and when you're the front runner, everything changes, the press comes, goes after you. It wasn't just that they were after, out to get us, they're out to get everybody who's the front runner, ask Mitt Romney if you don't believe that. Um, and so uh, I made a lot of mistakes. I couldn't get away with the stuff that made me uh, electable five times in Vermont was exactly what sank me in, um, in the national primary. I'd say what I thought if I wanted to do an audible without bothering to tell the staff what I was about to do, I did that. And those are things you can't do when you're running for president. Um, I mean, and most of the stuff I did was, was, was truthful. I mean, for example, I had to give a foreign policy speech in Los Angeles, it was early on, and I gave a speech at some, you know, the Foreign Affairs Club in Los Angeles or something. And it was the day that Saddam Hussein got captured. So I penciled out in a remark saying, and we are not safer because Saddam Hussein has been captured. Well, it was true, but it was probably the wrong thing to say on that day. There was a lot of stuff like that that I did. The second problem was Kate's right about the dysfunctionality of the campaign. The bigger the campaign got, the more dysfunctional it became. Uh, and actually, I should have made that change. But the problem is when you're... I had, had intended to make a, camp, a, a leadership change in the campaign in September. Unfortunately, when September came around, I was the front runner in the Democratic primary, and I, nobody who wants the story to be Dean shakes up campaign when he's the front runner. So that was a problem. And the third problem is our Iowa operation was nothing like what I thought it was. And the only person that really understood Iowa refused to go out there because he was crazy and thought that if he did go out, there would be a coup in the office and he'd get, get displaced, which by that time would probably had some truth to it. Um, so those are the three big reasons that we didn't um, win. 
Uh, obviously, I, I'm sorry we didn't win, and as time goes on, I get madder about it because I'm yeah. not a graceful loser. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was still an unforgettable experience, and um, who knows? We'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 hey, have your next book out in 2017. <laughs> It could be argued that he probably has more to do with electing Barack Obama than, say, Barack Obama and his staff would admit. Well, that's true. But more than they admit is true, because they don't admit anything. But that is true. That is true. And uh, your reward for helping to get President Obama elected was to get kicked to the curb and removed from the uh, National Committee. No, no, I was not removed. I quit. I resigned. The President gets to make his own appointment, and I was terrified that he asked me to serve another four years, and I resigned in a hurry after he won. That's true. But now to the next point, 2010, yeah. and the dismantling of the 50-state strategy. Yeah. Do you think the Democrats might have learned a lesson or two from both the 2004 campaign, what you did to build the party back and now going forward. Sure, look, well, Obama ran something close to a 50 state strategy in 2004, or 2008. I mean, I, we obviously set it up, but they still ran one. Um, and I, I, I don't think we've slid back. We certainly slid back. But when, the, when a Democratic president takes over, the DNC becomes their campaign vehicle. That's all the DNC does is, is work for the president's next election. And in terms of sliding back, we didn't slide nearly as far back as we had in the past. Uh, there still is some semblance of a 50-state strategy. I'd say it's closer to a 35-state strategy, but it's real. So I think we've made progress, but progress is not always a straight line up. It's, it's, it's wavy. Um, and so there is some semblance of a 50-state strategy still. Each state does still get some money. It's just not very much. Um, but uh, I think Obama under, uh, Obama's people, David Pluff, who I think is probably the smartest guy in politics right now, um, understands how you run a major campaign. I think David actually knows where every single Obama voter is in the United States, and now it's just a matter of getting them out um, to vote. I mean, the biggest, the most extraordinary thing in the Florida election, I mean, in the 2008 election, was winning Florida. Because I actually advised Obama not to bother. He saved himself $40 million because it was unwinnable. It turned out it was winnable. He sent the guy that did Iowa for him down there, and it was extraordinary what he did. It's the most complex state uh, in the country for a lot of reasons. So I don't think uh, I don't think there's been a huge amount of backsliding. There's been some because the nature of the DNC fundamentally changes when you have a president who runs the DNC. I, I wasn't in beholden to anybody. In fact, not only was I not beholden to anybody, I got to be the chair of the DNC uh, without the advice or consent of anybody inside the Beltway. Luckily for me, I knew that 97 percent of the people who mattered were outside the Beltway. I didn't pay any attention to the inside the Beltway people, which is something to do with how why I didn't get a job. <laughs> It was well worth it. I'm glad I'm here. So going back to the Iowa caucus, so many of us here were working on the ground, waiting for you to come to New Hampshire, uh, working to paying close attention. My understanding of the things I read was that um, you had many different people now descending into Iowa and helping out from all different states. I mean, just all. And then it kind of fell, not the speech didn't fall apart, but that in the end, the caucusing didn't happen. I mean, it didn't, fell, right. it didn't happen in their living rooms and everything. Two things happened. Uh, Is that and, reporting? Well, two things happened. Basically, two things happened in Iowa. The first is that when you do a caucus in Iowa, you've got to... You go through and you make all the calls to all the people you think are going to vote, and then you rank them one, two, three, or four, or whatever. And the ones and the twos you have to get to vote. Our, our ones were badly identified. You better go back and keep calling them, because of course all the other candidates are calling them too. And we didn't do that. So when we got out there and had all these ones and twos, turns out they really weren't. They hadn't been called in five weeks, and the work wasn't done. It just wasn't done. The second problem is that Kerry was desperate, and he did a great job. For John Kerry to mortgage his house when he's married to Teresa Hines is really quite a, something. And he hired, at the time, the best guy in America to go out and run the Iowa caucus for him, which was Michael Hooley. And Michael Hooley went out there and he did a fantastic job. Um, and meanwhile, our, some people in our headquarters made a bad decision to go after Gephardt. And so Gephardt and I were fighting like crazy. And when that happens, and there are other candidates, people decide they don't like either one of you, and they up the middle and Edwards, if, if I think that they, 
Iowa caucus had been a week and a half later, John Edwards would have won because he was the, sort of the scene as the person who didn't engage in any of the stuff. And there was actually some truth to that. The, one of the things there's little known stories about Iowa is the first super PAC really originated in Iowa. Not the same rules, but uh, Robert Gibbs, uh, Obama's press secretary, was in charge of a PAC for Gephardt. And Gephardt's people, Clark's people, Lieberman's people, and Perry's people all contributed lots and lots of money. Like one guy wrote a $200,000 check to put up ads with me and, and Osama bin Laden in them um, to convince people that who knows what, uh, what they were supposed to convince people of. But so, you know, there was a lot of ganging up, but of course the same stuff is going on uh, now. So there's a lot of reasons we didn't win Iowa, but I think the major reason we didn't win Iowa is because we just didn't do the job you're supposed to do to win Iowa. And that was just plain and simple the fact. Got somebody over there, two people, three people. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you behind this. <laughs> so this is for Kate. Um, was there any point in the time of the uh, campaign that just made you step back and say, wow? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, was, what was really interesting about the whole thing is that, you know, we started, again, Howard started this thinking about this in 2000. And then in 2001, we formed the PAC. And then 2002, he's like, this is ridiculous. Why are we pretending? You know, so we did this, the actual presidential committee. <coughs> and what was interesting about it, most of 2002, it was just like the two of us going around meeting with people one-on-one -on -one with people who didn't even have a clue who Howard was. And then it was like 2003, it took off but it took off in a way, like it just happened. And we shot up like, you know, rocket. And you almost don't know what's happening to you at the time. And I remember, you know, Howard and I, was, we've been asked this question before, and, there was, and there's a picture of it over here. We were in Seattle, Washington, and 10,000 people came out in Seattle, Washington, and they ended up closing the streets. And you're just looking like, you know, here's the governor of Vermont, and there were 10,000 people. But I also remember um, when we would fly, we'd always have to, I, for some reason, I would always get the one that had to get the extra security pat down. And um, so Howard would like blow through and then I'd be there for like 10 extra minutes. But I remember when we were at the um, airport in, um, I guess it was down in uh, Texas, maybe Dallas, Texas, and the people, when the um, security people started to recognize Howard, like it was almost like that was like, here we are. Because these are just regular people, you know, who are the TSA agents. And they would say, oh, you know, you're Howard Dean. So it was like you had the 10,000 people who were solid Dean people, but then when you had the people at like these huge airports from around the country that were, you know, patting you down and they're recognizing him. Um, so it was little, it was like the big stuff and the little stuff, and you're like, this is sort of freaky because it, it's Howard. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> not, to, not to insult him or anything, but you know, he was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I thought so too. <laughs> well, what was really interesting too, and I, and I talked a little bit about this in the book, and Howard, I think that's, um, your, not, that's your Paul Stewart suit, I think, right? Not no, your, that was a new one. Oh, <laughs> we, had a Paul, we had to go get him a Paul Stewart suit, and that was, uh, it, yeah. But before he, before that, and Julie knows us quite well, um, Howard to wear this suit that he got at J.C. Penney, and it was like, what, what like $125 or something suit. And one day Howard discovered that you don't have to dry clean it, you can put it in the washing machine, dry it, everything. So the biggest thing was when we go to these events, and this is before he had to have his fashion intervention, he was wearing his JCPenney suit, and we were out in Sacramento for the California State Convention, and he gave this really impassioned speech in the whole place. When he first got up, nobody cared. They were all yapping, they were all going around to eat. Then all of a sudden he starts going and going, and everyone started paying attention. And when the speech was over, there were people that were just like, going like this to touch his J.C. Penney suit. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like there was just sort of these odd things like that that would happen along the way. I don't know what, if, if Howard can remember his... Right. 
my, I, I, my wow was, uh, was the convention, because people were actually weeping, standing in the seats, throwing checks at us. The fun thing about that speech was it was a whole, there was 4,000 people, and there was a whole group of people over here who were obviously carry people. And they were, you know, clapping politely, but everybody else was going like that. And finally, and I was really cranked up. If you ever get a chance to see this speech, I've seen it. It's actually positively frightening for me. <laughs> I did that. And finally, I said, I don't want to listen to the fundamentalist preachers anymore. And even the Carey people got up. They couldn't sit down anymore. <laughs> but you remember that time in America. Everybody was terrified of the right wing. You just stand up and say they have no clothes. They still don't have a damn stitch on. Look what they're doing to the place. So, um, yeah, really. So, um, yeah, the Seattle thing was really amazing. Of course, you know, I am somebody who has never been overly impressed with themselves. So, my idea of the TSA people recognizing me were, yeah, so what? I, I just never quite got all that. But, you know, it's fun. I still, it still happens once in a while. People say, doesn't it ever bother you? The only photograph I've ever refused is I once got off a red eye in jet blue like this, and some kid said, oh, can I have your picture? And I started to say yes, and I said, no. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, when it, 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 it may be a pain to have people talk to you when you're next to, on, on airplanes, but when they stop, that's when you're in trouble. <laughs> I think the one behind you, Joe, I think she had her hand up first. Could, could you talk a little bit about the your Thomas Paine-like pamphlet that came out? Um, I thought that was a pretty innovative piece of campaign. Well, literature. in fairness, I take no credit for that, so you probably know something about how that got written. I know nothing yeah. about that. I just know people like it. Yeah. Well, what's funny about that is that was one of the big fights that went on between me and Joe and the campaign. Um, what Howard and I saw, and what the, the people in Burlington saw, were two different things. And what Chris is referring to is we had um, a pamphlet that was um, made after the common sense document that Thomas Paine wrote all those years ago. And um, they, did, they did that similar thing with the principles of the Dean campaign. And it's in the, like we talk about it, I talk about it in, this, in the book, Joe and I got in this massive fight about it because I thought it was a little bit too to the left. I thought we needed to make it to, towards the middle a little bit. And we actually ended up compromising at the end. But it really was something, it was, it was done really for the grassroots and for the people that were um, you know, on, the, on the web. And what it, what it asked everybody to do was sign this document and pledge their support to Howard. And it was actually really successful. It was, even though we got a big fight over it, it was, <laughs> we compromised. Let me, let me say something about that, because I, I, I've been reading a lot of stuff about the internet and so forth and so on, and I, so I want to bring up something that Clay Shifty also wrote about, who's really one of the smartest people I've ever seen. I never heard of him, heard of him before a few days ago when I started reading this book. He writes about our campaign. And what he wrote was actually an argument that we had in December, which I uh, made in this, or actually, I guess it was earlier than that which I gave in, I rarely give in to staff and take a little test of that over the years. When they do, they have to get eight of them in a room to sit on me for about three hours. So finally, we had this big argument about, I thought we should move to the center. Not to the center politically, but tone down my style, change it, start reaching out. And with the way Clay Shirky uh, talks about it was, it's basically um, mo motivating versus bridging. We did an enormous amount of motivating and building, building versus bridging. We built an enormous, loyal, loyal, intensely, deeply loyal group of people. Those are the people in the orange hats that came from all over the country to help us in Iowa. What we didn't do, which I needed to do, and I knew I needed to do it, but I just allowed myself to be, A, to be talked out of it, and B, frankly, because standing up in front of 3,000 incredibly loyal people is unbelievably intoxicating. Um, and we didn't do that. And I think if we had done that as we got closer to the nomination, we might have won. What Bill Clinton said to me as we were sort of moving this along, because he used to talk to all of us, uh, you know, each of the candidates who would call him, was that in order for people to vote for you as president, they have to see you as a president. So they loved me as an insurrectionist, which I was, but I never made the transition to becoming someone who looked like they were president of the United States. And unless you can visualize that as you run, you really can't get elected, because they eventually vote with their heads and not necessarily with their hearts. And I think, so that was one of the one of the issues. We needed to change from the Thomas Paine, not at the time. I think the Thomas Paine turned out to be very, very good. 
and I needed to change that. I didn't need to change the thing that I said, but I needed to change the tone of my message and the way in which I delivered the message, and that I failed to do it in a timely way. Okay, so um, we still have a little time, and they're going to sign some books over at that table. So, And everyone's books is selling them. How could I forget that? Right? Um, so thanks a lot. Let's, let's